let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Okay, Matthew chapter 17, and uh, we're going to be in verse uh, 14. Now, I'm reading in the Amplified. I'm also going to ask you, Chris, to throw up the uh, King James uh, in those same verses. So if you'll prep those for us. So here it is. When, the, when they approached the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, kneeling before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is a lunatic and suffers terribly, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they were not able to heal him. Now notice here, there's an assumption being made that they should have been able to heal him. Right? Remember, Jesus sent out 70 in, in groups of twos, he sent out the 70, and he said, all right, I want you to go and take my name, take my authority, and heal the sick, cast out demons. Now, they came back to him at one point rejoicing that the demons were subject to them. Do you remember this in the storyline? Okay. Here in this particular situation, they run into a situation with a young child, a young boy, who is seizing, he's being thrown into fires, falling in often, accidents, whatever. Uh, by the way, accidents in fire, water, these types of things are often an indicator of a deaf and dumb spirit or another kind of spirit. Um, I know in America, we don't have any demons. Demons don't exist anymore. They just exist in other parts of the world. But the scripture is very clear that demons are an aspect of what we face in the world. And the differences in America, they just look different. They're disguised differently, Right. Um, but let me say this to you. Jesus' mandate was that we cast out demons. So now that not being my text today, casting out demons, we're going to continue to move on. But Jesus answered, you unbelieving and perverted generation. Well, that's real pleasant. Right? <laughs> if I had posted that, if you post that on social media, I'm a very unkind, ungenerous pastor. If I say you perverted and unbelieving person, you, okay? I mean, Jesus just got to the point. Okay, Jesus was real matter of fact about stuff. That's what I love about the Lord, okay? He didn't pull any punches. How long shall I be with you? In other words, gosh, you guys are wearing me out over here. I'm getting real tired. If it were possible for me to be impatient as the Lord, I would be impatient with you right now, okay? But I have patience because I have all the fruits of the Spirit operating in perfection as the Messiah, right? You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Gosh, imagine you call me up and you need help. And I'm like, how long am I going to have to put up with this with you? Believe already, right? This is what the Lord is saying to his people here, okay? All right. All right. Jesus then rebuked the demon, okay? And it came out of him and the boy was healed at once, okay? Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. Now, this is the conference call with Jesus. This is, this is the corporate meeting later. All right, Jesus, privately, they didn't want to talk about it in front of anybody. They're embarrassed. They felt like they brought reproach on the name of Christ. They were just told, you have my authority to go do this. And then they come back in failure and going, Lord, what happened here? Okay. He answered, uh, and they said actually to him, they said, why could we not drive it out? Now, Jesus answered, he said, because of, this is the amplified of your little faith. Now, for that verse, Chris, Matthew 17, 20, throw up the King James for me, okay? And let's take a look at that. All right, here it is. Then, then Jesus rebuked, then they came. So that's 19, 20, give me 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Now, I personally like the way that the King James words the word better than the Amplified in this case. The Amplified is taking what unbelief means, meaning to have little faith, being faithless, whatever, but unbelief is the word. And, and as we talk today for a few moments about fasting, so I told you we're going in reverse. Jesus said in Matthew 6, when you give, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, remember what those three things do in your life, okay? Well, remember the challenge I gave you at the beginning of the year. Become a radical giver this year. Become daily and consistent in your prayer life and focused in your prayer life, meaning the daily prayer. Number three, fast throughout the year. So I've told you I have never called as a church a corporate fast in January with you. And the reason I have not is for most places it's kind of become 
a ritual, ritualistic, and religious in a way. If you notice, the only time Christians fast in a year is in January, and they all fast together, and they all do the Daniel fast, or they do whatever, and that's kind of what they do. And most of the time, we're focused on losing weight and feeling great in our resolutions, and we're missing the point of why Jesus said to fast in the first place, right? But this year, I personally, privately, now I told you um, on our website under our fasting challenge, even if you don't take it, you can go there and read what I wrote about it. That's on our website under fasting challenge in the top. If you're on a mobile device, you got to click those three little lines on the side and go down to the fasting challenge. But what I said to you there is that normally I fast throughout the year for extended periods of time and then shorter periods of time and duration throughout the year on and off all the time because I recognize it keeps me sharp. It keeps the anointing strong. Uh, uh, Charles Finney and Moody and many others said when they would notice kind of a dwindling, if you will, uh, less of an anointing maybe in a certain ministry or moment, they would go fast for two or three days at a time until that anointing was restored. Okay. Now the anointing is the power of God. Remember the person of the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit lives in me. I don't lose him if I don't fast. All right. But when I fast, what happens is I, I remove myself out of an equation, and I allow the Lord in me to show himself strong, okay? What is it, your number one enemy, what is our number one enemy? Your number one enemy is you. It's not even the devil. The Bible says the devil was defeated. Does that mean he can't assail me, attack me, fight against me, thwart me everywhere, try to block me? No, he does it all the time. But the Bible says he won't be victorious, I have already, I, I am already victorious through Jesus Christ. I'm more than a conqueror and I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. Even right now, even when I don't feel like it, that's the reality of what's been purchased for me. The problem is not even him. The problem is not even the world and the temptations that I face. The problem is my unbelief. The reason that we don't access everything that Jesus has for us, even though it's been purchased, imagine you have a bank account with a blank check and your name on it signed by your heavenly father in the blood of his son that says, cash this through your faith and all the resources, all the provisions, all the glory, all the miracles, all the wisdom, all the revelation, all the fruits of the spirit are accessible to you. In other words, Jesus is not going to come down from heaven and go back to the cross for you or me in this generation. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago was so sufficient and complete for all of eternity that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. But as a church in America and even around the world by and large, many, many Christians do not experience the power of God and the realities of God because we are in the way. We are too busy in our head. We're too busy in unbelief. So Jesus says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove, and it will be cast into the sea. Okay? Now, let's put up the word there for unbelief in the Strong's. I want to show you this word in the Greek. This word in the Greek is uh, Strong's number G570. So if you want to write that down, you can do that. Remember how you search Strong's. G means Greek. All right. If it were an H, that would mean it's Hebrew. You don't have to be a scholar of Hebrew and Greek to understand the meaning of a word. All right. If you've been here a period of time and you're following with us in studying the Greek and the Hebrew words in, in your Bibles, again, how do you do it? Just Google Matthew 17 Strong's and go to verse 20 on one of the Strong's you know, concordances uh, on a website and click it and it'll pull up this word. Now, here's what the word means. It means faithlessness, disbelief, lack of Christian faith, unfaithfulness, want of faith, weakness of faith, unbelief. All these things is what it means. Now, what I found fascinating is it also means disobedience. Look, unfaithfulness and disobedience. So, so remember what we've talked about in Romans 14, 23. The Bible says everything that you do that doesn't proceed forth from a position of faith is sin. In other words, unbelief in my life is sin. If God said it of himself and says you have access to it and I don't believe him, it's a sin to me. Because think about this, whether we like it or not, when we don't believe, when we have unbelief, what we're saying 
before the God of heaven is, I know that you're the God of heaven, but I can't take you at your word. And we don't do it on a conscious level, it's subconscious. Unbelief is this stubborn, rooted thing in us that's a part of the sin nature and the fleshly nature. Paul says in Romans that there is me and now my flesh. See, before you got saved, you were your flesh. But when you got saved, you became a brand new person. Your spirit, Paul says, I become a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed. Behold, all things are made new. And yet, wait a second, this body of death walks around with me and wants to act foolish sometimes. That's why Paul said, I have to beat it and bring it into subjection, right? He, he goes on to say in Romans, in the dissertation to the Romans, he says that, that, that uh, the person who does the thing that I shouldn't do is no longer me, but it's my flesh. He separates himself. I was in this here a few months ago, and God was showing it to me in a whole new light. And it, and it was really, he was giving me this revelation of the fact that it's not, it really is not me, because me's the person who agrees with the word and loves God and wants to do right now. I've been made brand new. I'm no longer subject to the sin nature, and yet my flesh can run amok and go do what it wants to do. And then I find myself doing that which I don't want to do. But it's no longer me who does it, it's the flesh. Does that make sense? So, so the Bible, the Bible tells us, gives us the solution to, to removing that stubborn unbelief and that flesh in our lives. And the answer is here. Okay, let's go back to Jesus' words. Now back in the Amplified. He answered, because of your little faith or because of your unbelief. If you only had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you'd say to the mountain, move from here, and it would be removed. And nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 21. Okay, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, I want you to see something in this context here. Remember what Jesus said in the storyline as he was teaching his disciples. Remember when, when John the Baptist's disciples and some of the leaders came and said, hey, how come your disciples aren't fasting? John's are fasting often, and yours aren't fasting at all. And Jesus said, why do they need to fast as long as I'm here? Remember that? He said, when I go home, when I leave, then they'll fast. Notice he says, then they will fast. Notice he says in Matthew 6, when you fast. Not if you fast. Fasting, none of us feel like fasting. Trust me. And we're going to get into some of the physiological aspect, the medical aspect here in a second to encourage you. But none of us feel like it. Okay? You don't feel like reading your Bibles all the time, do you? You don't feel like going to church all the time. I don't feel like worshiping God when something's going wrong in my life. Okay? Do you notice that there is nowhere in Scripture, watch this, there's nowhere in Scripture where God uh, 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 appropriates the requirement for your obedience based upon your feelings. That'll encourage somebody today. That'll just set you free right there. Okay? You mean I don't have to feel like it to obey the word? No. Because oftentimes we have to act our way into a new way of feeling. Okay? So what you'll find is when you obey God, think about it. Uh, Pastor Rick's testimony on tithing. He shared that he... Didn't want to tithe. He actually thought he'd come back to me a year later and say tithing isn't going to work. But he stepped out. He tested God. He didn't feel like it. He wasn't even doing it with a great attitude. But he did it. And later, now he loved, he's, a, he's a joyful giver because he acted his way. Instead of responding to his feelings, he responded to the word. So in the same way, Jesus tells us here what the secret is. Now, notice what he says. It's because this type comes not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, back to John and the disciples. Jesus, you and your guys aren't fasting, meaning uh, Jesus, guys, you're not fasting. John's are. Jesus said they don't need to fast when I'm here. So Jesus was not rebuking them for not fasting. What he was rebuking in them was unbelief. But what he was saying is that through prayer and through fasting, you remove unbelief. Notice what he did not say in this verse, and this is what I love the most. He does not say anywhere in here when they pull him aside secretly, hey, hey, Lord, why can not we do this thing? He never once says to them, it's because you don't have enough authority. <clears throat> See, if it was about you don't have enough authority, then we would have a problem, right? What he says is you just don't have enough 
belief, you don't believe. See, authority, you have all the authority right now as a believer that you'll ever need to cast out a demon, to conquer a mountain, an obstacle, to say to that mountain, be thou removed, and and nothing would otherwise be impossible for you. The only obstacle standing between you and appropriating the complete finished work is the fact that when you appropriate it, you don't always believe it. So fasting is the number one thing that, and the only thing with prayer that removes unbelief in the flesh. So let me give you a couple uh, uh, understandings on fasting biblically, okay? Fasting doesn't move God. Fasting is pleasing to God because it's my attempt to say, God, I want you more than I want bread, more than I want anything else in my life. What fasting really does is it brings us into, into the experience of Christ suffering on the cross so that I can be a participant of the glory of the resurrection. I cannot participate in his glory unless I participate in the sufferings of Christ. Now, I don't have to go to the literal cross. He did it for me. Okay? The Bible tells us these present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Okay? And yet, fasting is necessary. This is why so many people are spiritually dull. They don't have spiritual ears to hear because there's too much of them in the way. The only thing that gets my flesh out of the way is when I buffet my body, I beat my body, I bring it into subjection like Paul said in Corinthians. And the way I do that is through fasting. Now, in our fasting challenge, uh, I give you six different ways if you choose. There's no pressure from us. I won't be following up with you saying, hey, what's the deal? You didn't join us. Won't happen, okay? I'll be too busy praying myself through my fast, okay? All right? Now, having said that, I give you six different ways that you can choose to fast, right? For some, a water fast for, if you have never fasted, don't go for 21 days or seven, just go for, start with 24 hours. Right? Maybe do three days. I encourage you, liquid fasting, water fasting, Daniel fasting, intermittent fasting. If you're already intermittent fast and you decide intermittent fast, you didn't fast anything. Does that make sense? So, but if, if you don't intermittent fast and you give up one meal a day for 21 days, maybe that's a way you can join us. Okay? Maybe you can't medically fast food. Maybe the answer is I turn off the TV for a period of time. Maybe the answer is I turn off that social media or something. In other words, you're sacrificing something for a season of prayer and fasting with the Lord. Because now, biblical fasting, complete fasting is water fasting. Now, let me talk to you for a moment about some of the benefits of that. Let me highlight for you a couple examples. Jesus fasted. Now, Jesus had a perfect, sinless body. Because remember, he was not born of Joseph. He was born of our Heavenly Father. Okay? He, he who became sin, but he knew no sin, right? Jesus fasted, and before Jesus fasted, you don't see a single miracle, a single demon cast out, a single person healed, or anything else. It was only after he had fasted for 40 days, he was tested in the wilderness by the devil, he came out in the power of the Spirit, and then he went about doing all the good works, destroying and loosening the works of the devil. Fasting destroys and loosens the work of the devil in your life. And more importantly, watch, you're called to loosen and undo and dissolve the work of the devil in someone else's life. It's not enough. Disciples, we're not being disciples. It's all we do is are be receivers of the gift of grace. He said, freely you've received, freely give. You become a disciple when you're a giver of the, of the work that you've received through Jesus. You're just a convert as long as you're receiving. When you recognize the anointing within you is for you and the anointing that's upon you is for others, then you're moving into maturity in the church. Then you're moving it into maturity in the word because then all of a sudden I recognize that there are other people out there who are bound by the devil directly or indirectly in some way, shape, or form. And my discipleship responsibility, if I really love the Lord, I'll love what matters to him. And so one of the things we do when we pass into fasting is we say, God, what I do when I'm fasting is I picture in my mind, what's my vision? What's my goal? Am I doing this to be cute? Am I doing it to to, to lean? No, none of that matters to me. I only go on a fast for one reason, and that's because I believe God that I want to see a greater anointing in my life to set people free, to minister his word, to disciple other people, to do what God has placed in my life and in my heart to do and, and is in your heart as believers. But we don't come to it as long as we're getting in the way. So unbelief is the number one thing. Remember, he said, if you had faith, 
like the grain of a mustard seed. It doesn't take much faith. The mustard seed was the smallest of all the herbs and the plants, and yet it grew up to be a 10-foot-tall tree, right? He's saying it doesn't take much. So we don't need more. We just need to remove the unbelief that stands between us and the finished work of the cross. And so fasting is one of those things that does it. So Jesus fasted. Now, Jesus also was baptized. Did Jesus need to be baptized? What, what did John say to him? I don't know. <laughs> you need to be baptizing me. Now, Jesus said to him, let's do this because it's fitting and proper before the Lord. In other words, Jesus is our type and our example in all things, in every way. If you want to know how to live the Christian life, you look at Jesus. It's that simple. Okay? And Jesus fasted. Jesus said, when you fast. So my encouragement to you is in 2023, make sure you find times. Now, here's how I started my journey many years ago. I started out by fasting one day. And, and that one day was I, I would eat dinner and I'd go to bed and then I'd fast until that evening and have dinner that night. So like evening to evening, very much similar to the way the Hebrew calendar cycle would work. Okay. So for me, that was, and I was probably dying that first day, the first few times you ever do it, because it, it challenges you if you've never done it before. Okay. And we'll talk about hunger and all those things here in a minute. Is it bad for you? Is it good for you? What? But then I thought, okay. Uh, by the way, the early church, the early Christian church fasted twice a day. The early Christian church fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays, typically. Okay, if you go look in history. Okay, uh, so that would mean two meal or, or two days out of the week. Why? Because they were staying sharp. There's some of the greats like D.L. Moody and others that would not even uh, uh, ordain people who weren't committing to fasting at least twice a week. Right? Charles Finney, throughout his writings, and I love his writings, if you read Charles Finney, one of the great evangelists and preachers in American history, um, he, he oftentimes discusses the lack of power and anything that anybody was carrying in his time. The, the apostasy and apathy of the Christian church is very similar to our generation today. If you really have the resurrected Christ, what's the proof? The Bible says the proof is when you go about in my name doing the things I tell you to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see that I back it up. But what is it that stands between us and the promise of Jesus in Mark 16? It's our unbelief. So fasting helps us do that. So uh, Jesus fasted 40 days. We know Moses fasted 40 days. Elijah fasted 40 days. These are examples of extreme, complete fasts. Now, Moses fasted water and food. That is not possible as far as the human body other than he was in the glory of God on the mountain, face to face. The Bible says Elijah fasted 40 days from the food of an angel. A an angel fed him, and then he went in the strength of that food. I'm still praying and believing before the 21-day cycle hits that maybe God will visit me with angelic food, and I won't even feel hungry at all, okay? And yet, these are extreme examples and very possible examples, right? Write this down. I'm going to give you the title of a book that I'd love for you to read, go on Audible, do something with it. Even if you don't fast, remember, even if you don't join the 21 days, there's no pressure. Just, just agree with us that you're going to be praying during those 21 days. You're going to be praying for the church, praying for your lives. I told you this is the year of increase for you and this church. I'm believing for increase for you personally. I know God wants to increase your businesses and your ministries and your homes and all those things, okay, your families. God cares about everything that concerns us, okay? Now, this book is called The Atomic Power of Prayer and Fasting by Franklin Hall. It's my, I've made, read many, many works on fasting. It's my favorite, okay? Okay. Another awesome author in the medical side of fasting, uh, Franklin Hall. The Atomic Power of Prayer and Fasting, Franklin Hall. He also has multiple other books. This was written in the 1940s, I believe. T.L. Osborne credits his miracle ministry to this revelation and teaching that's in this book. Okay? Um, the, uh, many of the healing revivalists that came out of the 1950s credit much of this work to there was a renewed vision for fasting and prayer in the church in the 40s and the 50s, which brought on the healing revivals. Okay? Fasting is like the atomic bomb with prayer versus just prayer by itself is like a bomb. The atomic bomb is prayer and fasting together is in essence the, the book. What I love about the book is it gives you the spiritual aspect of it. It gives you the natural side of it as well and the practical tips. Another author to read, this is a natural author, not a Christian author, just a doctor, Dr. Jason Fung. He's one of my favorites. He has the obesity code, um, the diabetes code. He's also written uh, the complete guide to fasting. 
Okay? Dr. Jason Fung, F-U-N-G. He is just one of many, but he's one of my favorites on the topic of autophagy, intermittent fasting. So let me talk to you for a few minutes because I'm running out of time for you today. I want you to be able to, to go do what you want to do and be with your families and quit being told about fasting so you can go eat your lunches. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go eat a good lunch after this because I got to, I'm counting down my days. But part of what I want to encourage you, remember when, if, if you choose to fast. And again, some of you might say, I'm going to join for two days. And that's it. That's fine. It's okay. Don't fast out of religion. Don't fast out of compulsion. Don't fast because you feel uh, like you're bound to. Fast because you love your Lord. Fast because you're longing for the bridegroom. He said, when I go away, they're going to fast because they're longing in love for me. So fasting is, God, I want to experience your glories on earth. I don't want to wait till heaven. I want to experience your glories on earth. I love you. I'm waiting on you. My, my, my lamp stands are ready. My oil is burning. My wicks are trimmed, and I'm waiting on the Lord Jesus. Come, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord. That's what fasting's about, okay? Fasting, I told you, I don't ever advertise when I'm fasting. This year, I felt led to challenge you to join me only because I'm doing it, and I'm doing it but for our church. I'm doing it for the anointing. I'm doing it to see the glory of God manifest in our lives in a greater way. I'm doing it before I go to Pakistan this year in, in February. I'm leaving on the 13th uh, of February. I'm going to India the final two weeks of March. Now, these two nations are in the top 10 most hostile nations on earth toward Christianity. I always tell people this isn't Cozumel and Hawaii. I, I keep asking the Lord if he'll call me to those places, right? And maybe at some point he will. I know he will. God, I'm believing you for Maui, okay? All right? We're going to do some revival campaigns there. But the point is, I'm not going there because it's cute. I'm going because God has opened doors. He's called us to nations. And he just happens to. I, I, I tease with him, but he's just happened to the first few major nations he's opened for us in media and whatever are two of, in the top 10 of the most dangerous in the world, the most radicalized in the world toward Christianity. One is a radical Hindu government. The other one is a radical Islamic government. Okay? Where preaching Christianity and getting people converted is illegal. Right? So you want to go into those environments under the anointing. I want to come into this environment here, even though I'm not worried about being dragged out in the street and stoned in Farmersville, I want to come into this environment under the anointing. My heart is never to step up here without the anointing. You don't need preaching out of here. There's enough of that in our country. We need it out of here because it comes from a personal revelation. So fasting is one of those things that there is nothing in your life, by experience I can tell you, and by the scriptures. Now, I want to encourage you, go do some study on fasting, because for time's sake, I can't be exhausted today. Okay? And I'll probably, if you're joining the fasting challenge, I'm going to send you some personal texts throughout that challenge, and I might even do some videos online for those, even who might not be joining, but you want to learn more about fasting, because there's so much to teach you on. But I can't teach you exhaustively on a Sunday morning. Okay, I'm going to be teaching you on those three tenets over the next few weeks. Remember, next weekend's increase. We're going to talk about increase. Come Saturday, Sunday night. Get encouraged in your faith about the increase that God has for you. Okay, and then the the weekend after that, uh, put these dates down. I didn't mention this, but I need to. Uh, the 21st and the 22nd are our vision services. These are our services. I encourage you to be in both. These are our services where I will line out the vision for our church for 2023. And we will, we will spend time in prophetic ministry with each and every person who wants it. Every year in our vision services. Now, we don't wait for vision services to do prophetic ministry. The altars will be open when, you, uh, when we're out of here today if you need healing, a word, whatever. But, but these services specifically are designed for you to begin to write down the vision that you have for the year for your families. We put them in that box over there. I never read them. We seal them, and we pray over them every time we're in the sanctuary as a church and as a ministry. So we're about to take 2022 out of there, give them back to people who, who used them, and, uh, meaning who filled them out, and then we put in 2023. Part of what I'm sharing is the vision for this house, and then we are also asking God to bring clarity and vision for your lives prophetically and through his word into your 2023. Because if you will set your heart to do what God wants you to do and calls you to do in 2023, it's going to be your most successful year. It doesn't matter what the economy does. Doesn't matter who's in the White House or what they do. Doesn't matter if there's wars and rumors of wars and all the above. Remember, God promises to oversee your blessing if you obey Him. 
So the only thing that blocks God's blessings in my life is my obedience and my unbelief, right? If I don't believe that it's for me, then I can't receive it. I believe and I receive by faith what he's completed for me, okay? So a couple quick things as we, as we get ready. We've got five minutes, all right? I always like to have you at 1130. Let me give you some practical sides to water fasting. If you're not going to water fast this time, that's okay. Don't worry about it. But let me share with you some physical benefits. Your body goes into a form of autophagy within a period of 36 hours to 72 hours, okay, of water fasting. So I'm encouraging you to, to practice this at some point in your life, okay? Autophagy is Greek, and it's, it comes from a twofold portion of words that mean self-eating, okay? Auto, self, and phoji is uh, the Greek derivative, and that word comes from eating. In other words, your body begins to cleanse its dead cells and glyconated cells and clogged up cells. What it begins to do, there is nothing, Hippocrates and many others throughout society, uh, every, every major religion, whether it's the Islamic religion, the Buddhist religion, you name it, they all practice fasting as a discipline. Yogis practice it, you name it. Let me say something to you. We're Christians that have the Holy Spirit. We should be sharp in fasting. If the world fasts, and they're not even fasting to Jesus, we should be fasting and we should be, the world is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. And the only thing that's stopping us from manifesting greater glory, greater revelation of him is ourselves and our fast. So your body goes into autophagy. Autophagy begins, there is no, no faster way, the only way to, to renew the years, to back up your life, to give you longer life, to purify the blood. Think about your blood circulatory system as like oil in a car, okay? When you're constantly putting something in it, you're never allowing it time to do what it does. God caused your body. This is the secondary benefit, but it's radical. When you fast, when you go into water fast, any calories keep me out of autophagy. So again, I'm just talking water fasting here, okay? I'm just encouraging you that. When you water fast, 24 hours, that's great. If you work up to three days sometime, do that, okay? Maybe some of you want to fast for seven days in this period, and then you're going to do liquid fast and other things, okay? Your body goes into the self-cleansing mode, and all of a sudden, things in your body that are going wrong, you didn't even know were going wrong, are beginning to be restored and be healed. Do you know that nowadays they relate Alzheimer's? They call it uh, uh, like diabetes type 3 now. Because diabetes type 2 and different things like that, they have found, and Jason Fung teaches, he writes an entire book on this concept about the ability. He learned about intermittent fasting and autophagy and fasting because as a doctor, he had all these type 2 diabetes patients that were coming in, and they were prescribing insulin and all these things, and they weren't getting any better. And he learned over a period of time through study and research that as a matter of fact, you can reverse much of the effect of type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's and all these things. Do you know Alzheimer's is a result of inflammation in the brain and glycogenation of the cells? So they get clogged. Glycogen, what is it? It's glucose and sugars. We constantly put in our systems. And our bodies, our cells, so autophagy is the process where I quit putting stuff in my system, and what happens is my body goes to work clearing out the deadness. Think about a brand new car that you get and you love, and, and you drive it, and you have great memories in it, and over time it becomes junked out. It becomes junky. It looks bad. And at some point, you have to replace pieces and parts in the car to keep the car running effectively. At some point, you replace the whole car. Well, picture the cells in your body like that car. Those cells are, are eaten and they're destroyed in a positive way when you fast. And the only thing that induces it is, is cutting out food and caloric intake. Water, you take water the whole time. Water's purifying, it's cleansing, right? That's why, that's why God uses it as an example of the spirit or the word, cleansing of the washing of the water of the word. But when I remove food for a period of time, Okay? Not only will your, will your spiritual senses be sharpened, and let me tell you where I find that they're sharpened. It's not always in the middle and the midst of those days, because sometimes those days can be hard to focus. It's difficult. The, the more sugars and carbs you've been living on, the harder it is. The more your, your tongue, you'll get a coating on your tongue. You'll have different things happening. Your breath won't. You know what that is? It's all good things. You know why? Because your body is starting to expel toxins. Do you know that that's why Jesus said, wash your face and put on perfume and do all that stuff? Because you, you, 
the first few days, especially of fasting, while your body's getting out the toxins, your kidneys are purified, your heart is purified, your blood, do you know life is in the blood? And your blood gets clogged and your blood gets thick. When you fast, you start to open up the arteries and the blood circulation and it starts flowing smoother and better. And you literally, when you're done, when you're done through the process and as you begin to consume a little food, break your fast, next thing you know, you'll, your skin will look younger and more vibrant. You will be able to renew much of your youth. Now, why is this? It's because you have just gone through this godly process. So it is my motive to, fa- you know, the world fasts that way. If you go follow these circles with Jason Fung and many others, I found them through keto and other things in my life. Let me tell you, you've got entire groups of people that will fast and they don't know Jesus. They're fasting for the health benefits. We're fasting for the twofold purpose of knowing that I'm going to grow in the glory of God. And oh, at the same time, I'm gonna, my joints are going to be made strong. My bones are going to be tendons, sinews, things I don't even know are going wrong. Right? God begins to heal and perfect those in our lives through fasting. Okay? So fasting to close. I said this the other day, and I shared this. All right? it's, on our, it's on our page, meaning on our social medias. Uh, uh, but this is what I said. Fasting causes us to experience the glories of heaven because the glory of heaven is yours. It's available through Jesus Christ. But the only thing standing between me and realizing that appropriation is me. And fasting, so again, I encourage you, if you want to fast with us, you can. How you do that is you go to our website and then uh, you click on the fasting challenge. You just go down, you pick one of the ways that you want to, you feel led of the Lord. Pray about it if you feel led. We got people in our church, uh, all of our church doing it. And we have people, members of our church that have people in their offices doing it and different places. It's exciting. So you don't even have to, there might be somebody in your life you challenge to join us and pray with us, even though they don't attend. That's okay, right? So whatever you choose to do, remember the focus is prayer and fasting. If you fast, For 21 days and you don't spend any time in prayer, you missed the point. You're better off fasting one day and spending extra focus in prayer that day than fasting 21 and and, and only focusing on what the scale said and your job and trying to, you know, you can't stop working. But what I'm saying is three days of prayer and fasting is more powerful than 30 days of just fasting without prayer because then you're just on a medical thing, right? So realize that Jesus would never call you, watch me, he will never call you to do something that's harmful to you. So even though it doesn't feel good to the flesh and we hate it, our flesh is so ornery and it likes to back talk a lot. Have you ever noticed that? Okay. I don't like this. I don't want to do that. Shut up. Okay. Let your spirit man be in charge. Tell your flesh where it belongs. Okay. You're not subject to it. And, and what happens is your body will be revitalized. Okay? Even on a liquid fast, it's going to help you. Even taking one less meal a day, whatever you choose to do. So let's stand to your feet. I just want to encourage you today. I'm going to bless you here, and then we're going to let you out. I'm a couple minutes over. I apologize. The Bible says if you choose not to forgive me, God can't forgive you. So I need your <laughs> forgiveness. Okay? <laughs>